release. Um, if you have any questions, please please put it in the chat, and I'll bug Bill to uh, Phil to give you the answers. I will. On to you. All right, everyone. This Take is being over. this is being recorded. Watch your language, um, and then I'll send you a link, Laura. You can download it and uh, post it internally. Uh, we're going to talk about Enscape 3.0. I've been just a quick introduction. Uh, studied architecture and engineering, and uh, ended up working with Revit Technology and then started my own consulting practice. And I've been working with the Enscape team since July of 2015. So I, I understand the design tools you guys are using and the design workflow and I understand Enscape. So when you have questions, please reach out to me directly. And uh, if I'm not sleeping, I'll answer your question. That's how it works. So let's get started with Enscape. So here's Revit, it's a lot of test file. Here's Enscape, and some things have moved around in 3.0 uh, because- I can't see your screen. Oh, see, that's a good thing to tell me now. Let me see. How about this? Click. Oh, now it does a thing. It puts there it is. All, I've got all these menus. Can you guys see all my whole screen, or is it parts of it blacked out or like whited out? We just, we just see the Revit. Okay, and you Enscape. can't see, and Enscape. Well, that's okay, good, okay. It's just like on a desktop, a laptop. It's just already small enough space. All right. So uh, two people have entered the waiting room. Admit all. See, this is where I have to multitask. And let's move this out of the way a little bit. So what changed in Enscape 3.0 is that Enscape, fast forward five years from 2015, uh, they have to support five design applications. So in addition to Revit, there's SketchUp, Rhino, ARCHICAD, and Vectorworks. And it, I think feature parity is across all design applications now. And it, became, it, 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 it is a particular challenge to try to adapt the user interface across five design applications just to do the same thing five different ways. So effectively what they've done is left the global settings and anything that's specific to that particular design application inside the tab for that design application, like here in Revit. It says Enscape, and there's some tools specific to Revit, and then there's some general tools. Everything else has been moved to the Enscape window. So in broad terms, the upper left side are all your feature functions, and on the upper left side are all of your project-specific settings or file-specific settings. So we're gonna go through each of those. Um, help you guys understand what is where and why, let you ask some questions as we do this, and then we're gonna get into some good best practices. All right, so the first thing is, we'll actually start with Revit. Um, I was mentioning before that you used to, you if you had to, uh, Enscape basically kept any view, any project or design tool specific applications in the general, general option here. So for example, uh, render image into document. That's a Revit specific thing. It, if you click this option, it's going to create a rendering and then save it in your project browser under renderings. Uh, in your project browser, that tab doesn't show up or that option doesn't show up until you create a rendering. Um, the next option is, is also kind of global. It's not just project specific, but it is the um, asset library option. I'm just opening it now and I can hear someone's Someone might need to mute yourself because everyone can hear the scratching noises and stuff. I'll just open this up. Uh, a little couple of things that are important that uh, changed here with regards to assets. Um, Enscape has formalized custom assets. So if you create custom assets, designate a folder, you can actually leverage content that's been created in other design applications. There's some post-processing involved. You can't just drag and drop. Um, but your custom assets can have extraordinary detail, and then you have a lightweight proxy that is rendered in Enscape. The Enscape assets are now available to be stored offline. So that's a really important function. Whenever you open the Enscape asset library, it has to refresh these thumbnails, and you can, you can actually speed things up a lot if you'll just download them locally. Uh, it takes about three gigs for the download, but I think it's, it's a, a worthwhile. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to find you. Where is this person at? 
if I only knew how to mute quickly. I am going to, nope, I can't go there. Somebody please mute yourself because we can hear you in the background. I think they got it. All right, good. All right, so the first thing is uh, we, we talked about render image document, the asset library option, nothing really changed with manage uploads. Under the general settings, there are some important settings here. Number one, you can turn on and off rest mode. So rest mode is what happens when you stop moving and animated textures stop animating. So it's frozen. That is because rest mode is turned on. You can now make rest mode inactive. And so if you have an animated texture, if you have an animated procedural material like grasses and trees and things, uh, it'll just continue to render. It's going to be a little computationally heavy. You're going to hear your fan turn on and start uh, start cooling off your graphic card if you leave this option on, but it's quite nice if you've got a presentation open and you're just waiting to get started to have a little bit of uh, visual interest. The other important option here under Revit is this option to enable the live Revit camera in Revit that represents the orientation and location of the Enscape camera. And if I click that option and turn it on, I'm just gonna rotate the view a little bit where it's about the same spot. So here's the Enscape camera. And if we go over here to Enscape and we move around and we go back to Revit, we see that the camera has moved. This is a really important um, tip for you guys. This feature has been there a long time, but the problem with the default Enscape camera is it actually looks like this everywhere. So plan, section, elevations, and they're kind of, it's kind of hard to see if it's you know, kind of unobvious, you can't really tell which way it's pointing. What I recommend that you guys do is open that Enscape camera. It's a Revit family. Tell all of this geometry never to show up uh, in a plan view course level of detail and replace it with a detail item. Okay, so create a nice, uh, nice boundary object. And this will give you an indication of where the camera is and which direction it's pointing when you're in Revit. The other thing you'll want to do is add a nice reference line to the family because once that camera as a as a Revit family gets above the cut plane to a certain point, it's, it stops showing up. And so I've just added a line here that sets it about three feet off the ground. So even if we're, you know, quite a bit high up, when you go back to Revit and look at that component in a plan view, which is a lot of times where you are, um, you can see where you are in the project and you can have Enscape open on another window. This is also a very useful tool from the standpoint of being able to move the Enscape camera from Revit. So if you're creating a very, very specific animation, you wanna be at a particular location, um, a particular elevation, and you wanna be absolutely sure that the camera is pointing at a certain object, well, you can even use your align tool and align that camera. We can select it, we can know the pitch angle. So negative value is down and a positive value is up and a, a zero value is going to look straight ahead. And we can see that the height value is here. So let's set it down to about five feet. Now, this is a great starting point if you want to very specifically place uh, a keyframe in Enscape to be moved in Revit. Because if we just start you know, placing a keyframe here and then we decide to go over here, you don't know if the height's changed, the angle might have slightly changed. Right, here's the camera. It's no longer pointing straight ahead and it's actually changed pitch slightly. So using that Enscape camera will allow you to very, very specifically set the camera up and uh, point it the right direction for setting up keyframes in your animation, which will we'll cover some of the animation tool and what's changed in a moment. Um, so really no other settings here in the, uh, in the Revit tab. G everything else has moved to the Enscape window. So let's see what's moved. On the left side at the upper right, upper left-hand corner is all of the feature function. And on the left-hand side is sort of all of the project specific settings, not global settings. So I'll just go through those in, in, very quickly. Uh, the home button allows you to, well, some of these buttons like with a collaboration tool, I'll just show you here. If I try to turn it on and off by double clicking, doesn't work, you have to close a window. Others work differently. Like with a BIM tool, you click it, it just depends, it's a little inconsistent, but your home button will actually do the same thing. So it's a little redundant, but that's what the home button does. It just turns off those other menu options. The collaboration tool allows you to select objects and add comments to them, design notes, revision notes, 
and you can select you know single elements and then create an issue you can always you can also export those issues i think it's a bcf file format the bim tool allows you to select things and know what the parameters are that's coming from the design tool so in this case it's a, a particular family name and here's the parameters assigned to it you can also select objects by an entire class let me just zoom out a bit and move up so if we go down here to furniture, everything that's furniture is being selected and then you have individual elements or if we select generic models, you can see everything that's being uh, pre-selected. So the BIM tool just allows you to work inside of Enscape, not have to leave Enscape. If you want to know something about a family component, what category it's on, what it is. Um, this next option is view management. So this was a big change in 3.0. In the past, if you wanted to change the view that was being used to drive Enscape, so let's say you had a view where everything's shown, you had another view with a section box. You had to go over here in Revit and select an active document. That's no longer required in 3.0. You can select this option for view management or press the F key. And all of these views can be accessed from within inside Enscape. So for example, uh, this is just my default 3D view. But if we select the uh, Enscape view 09, it turns on the section box and actually respects that view and in Enscape, it's just changed, or in Revit, it's just changed the active document. So you can do this directly from the Enscape window now. You don't have to go back to the design tool to make a change. I like working from my default 3D view because uh, if, you, if you like to turn on the section box quickly to on a large project and you just want to invoke the section box, the section box is invoked by default on the default 3D view, the view that's created when you push the little house icon. So if you're jumping around a large project and you just need to isolate what you're looking at um, with a section box, it's really handy. I like a keyboard shortcut to actually turn on the section box, but it's going to put the section box on in the default 3D view. So for that reason, I just tend to work from the default 3D view in Enscape. What's also changed is you, you can now create views. Uh, so if we decide to create a new view of the project, we we'll just go over here change the time of day and select create view. We can just give this uh, default name Enscape 3D View 11. At the moment, you have to create the view. And then once the view is created, you can decide if you want to favorite or apply a visual preset and then save the view. And now you can recall that view here, or you can recall the, the view can be recalled directly from within inside Enscape. Uh, in the next version, you won't have to save it and then update it. You'll just be able to save the view and do everything in one go. This next option is for the animation tool. Now, there, I, I would be, I'd be really glad to go through a deeper dive on the animation tool. I think there's some really beautiful subtlety here. Uh, and there's some great client project examples online now. Just, just really beautiful work. And, but there's idiosyncrasies in the animation tool. So, if I'd love to do a deep bot dive. I'd love to show you where the uh, there's some road potholes in the road of the animation tool that you want to avoid. I can show you guys how to do that, but um, it's just going to take more time. Suffice to say that there's a lot more editing that goes goes on directly inside of the Enscape window, and um, they've added the feature to be able to add a camera before the beginning camera and after the last camera and make it really really easy. But uh, it, it's really a deeper dive if you want to get it there in any detail. Um, single image rendering or batch rendering has changed slightly, and this is important. So if you want to, if you want to save and render your favorites quickly, the option to do that is not very obvious. It's here, uh, this little small triangle. You select it, and it allows for you to select all the views or any views that you favorited. So what's a favorited view? Well, we'll close this and go quickly back to view management. And we'll say, uh, you know what, I really like this first view. So we'll click this little star and hit save. And uh, this other view, that's, that should definitely be batch exported. And then when you save those views and you go back to batch rendering, you know, I have the ability to select all the favorites and it's just gonna grab those views that you've uh, designated as a favorite view. You can also just hold your control key down and render a few that way, or you can click inside of this button once and it'll just grab everything and it'll batch render to where you specify. At the moment, um, it, it's been a really common request, not just to be able to do batch rendering of still images, but batch rendering for panoramic files. So if you're 
if you want to create a bunch of panda files and upload them. My understanding is that's supposed to be coming in the next release as well. Um, so nothing really with regard to the panorama files. Uh, it's still the same function and the ability to upload them. We don't have password protection. It's been requested, but it still hasn't been uh, implemented yet. And then this last uh, option is the ability to save files out of Enscape into a format that other people can explore. So with a web standalone and the, uh, or the EXE file, which actually requires a computer capable of running Enscape, and then the web standalone, which is gonna publish that explorable file to the web. So that's where things have moved uh, in these sort of feature function settings. Any questions so far? I don't see anything in the chat. All right. So I'm gonna keep going here. I'll just start with a sort of project specific settings. The mini map allows you to see a plan view of the project at all times. Honestly, I tend I'm not sorry, to- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Phil. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I gotta turn my chat on properly. <laughs> so um, Simon, Simon wanted to know if you can show a case how to display the camera in Revit. Oh, did you do that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so all, all you have to do is go back to your Enscape tab uh, under general settings, it's not a project specific setting, go to Revit, the Revit option and just enable live Revit camera. When you click that, it's gonna close the window and put you back into Revit. That's all you do. And then to get it to go away, do the same thing again. So as mentioning the mini map, I mean, it's kind of useful, but for me, I just prefer to have Enscape and Revit open side by side, um, have the project on one screen, have Enscape on the other, and then as you navigate around the file, you have the ability to see where your camera is. It's kind of a map, but it's not a mini map, which I think the mini map is too small, but some people may find it useful. Whenever you render an Enscape, it's not going to render exactly what you see in the window, unless you take a screenshot, I think. Um, if we set this view up, change the time of day, and render this view, what's gonna happen is it's actually going to render it based on your capture settings which are illustrated by selecting this option. It shows you your safe frame. The capture settings, just to jump ahead real quick, um, if we go to the visual settings here under output, here's your resolution if you're saving images. And that aspect ratio is not necessarily the aspect ratio of your Enscape window. So this safe frame option allows you to set up views and know what's going to render based on your, uh, your present output settings. This next option allows you to see uh, Enscape in a variety of perspective modes. So, you know, three point perspective, two point perspective, and then orthographic mode where everything is, uh, where all the edges are parallel and perpendicular. Um, under orthographic mode, a little tip is if you're on a, if you're on a laptop that doesn't have a keyboard, you can still get to your cardinal views of, of, of plan and elevation by using the Windows keyboard key and clicking on those numbers and that'll put you into those cardinal views. The next option is fly and walk mode. That's just gravity or not gravity. You can also invoke it with a space bar. Click and you're now walking around at whatever eye height you designate. Um, and then if you hit the space bar again or change it to fly mode, you can now move up or down. Uh, this next option is to enable a VR headset. Enscape still supports Oculus Rift, HTC Vive and Windows Mixed Reality. Uh, nothing else on the horizon right now. I get a lot of emails with regard to um, there's another one. It's not Oculus Rift, but it's in the same, it's like the Quest or something, and it's a game headset. It's yeah, it's the wireless Quest, yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't get it. It's it's buggy. The frame rate's laggy without a wire, but the thing is, even with a wire, I've had customers say, oh, it worked, and it stopped working, it's never worked again, and we don't know why. So don't get them. And then under the visual settings, this is all your project specific settings and where you can save and load other visual settings. Again, it's not very obvious. It's here on the left-hand side. And now we have visual settings. Um, you can also import them, save them. The ones that I really care about, I mean, I like white mode, but I do turn on the outlines a bit. I change the field of view down from 90 degrees, which is default to 65. Under the image settings, I usually drop the saturation a bit because I think it's just a bit too bright and garish. And then everything else is pretty much the same. I don't change anything there. Uh, and I usually keep 2K images as a default rendering. Something that does confuse customers time to time, Enscape users, 
is this option for ultra high, medium, and draft. This is the live render quality, it has nothing to do with saving images or creating animations. If you're using a VR headset, I recommend dropping the resolution down to high. And the reason for that is um, when Enscape is processing, things are a little bit fuzzy, like the clouds on this, uh, on this globe. And when you stop moving, they kind of get crisp. Well, they can get crisper faster in high mode than in ultra mode because it does, it's not doing so many render passes. It's not a big deal on, the, on, on a workstation or laptop, but if you're in VR, your head is the mouse and your head can't stop moving. Um, and so things can appear fuzzy just all the time and that can be pretty distracting. So for VR, I actually drop it down to high and the overall uh, impression is better than moving it up to ultra. And those are the visual settings um, or sort of project specific settings. Um, I'm gonna jump, unless there's any questions, I'm gonna jump into some best practices. Nope, chat is clear. All right. So look, the first thing you guys are, are gonna have to think about is lighting and illumination. You don't necessarily have to start putting lights in your project uh, just to get your project to glow at night. There's something called, um, uh, there is a light source that is just a light symbol with no geometry around it. It's called a studio light in Revit. So studio light RFA, and that lets you just put a glowing orb of light that you can see little model lines in 3D. You can put that in your project and actually if you have a, let's say you're doing an office building or a commercial project and you have to show the building at night, instead of putting individual lights in your project, you could just place a few of these uh, studio lights at, you know, as opposed to putting lights up in the ceiling and, and all of that. But the, the, the biggest issue with regard to lighting, I think, is self-illumination. So there's lots of things that have to glow in a low light condition that are not lights, strictly speaking, right, in terms of Revit. Um, so lights that have to schedule as lights, they behave as lights, they have a light object in them. There are lots of things that need to illuminate, such as exit signs, um, some, you know, this video game cabinet, these materials, textures, uh, if you're doing set dressing and you need to kind of create a very gentle kind of certain emotional appeal in the project, like with candlelight or small light sources, um, even something very practical like a system family containing nested family components like a stair or a railing or a baluster, you can't get lights to behave in them properly. So you're going to use self-illumination. And that's a really, really easy thing to do. It's just a matter of selecting the geometry and telling the geometry that it has self-illumination. So if we go back here, just go to a 3D view and select this light. There are materials assigned to each of these numbers and the materials have been given self-illumination. The self-illumination is different than the material color that you give it. You can actually have a difference. So you have, because you have a graphic appearance, which does not necessarily have to match uh, the render appearance, but often does. So this render appearance also matches the graphics appearance. And if we look here at the self-illumination, we're using the same color again to represent it in a low light condition. So if we start to go into a low light condition, it still glows in a, in a sort of a yellow tone. So it's going from yellow to yellow. And self-illumination is going to give you all of these edge conditions. So things like, um, casework that has to have very subtle lighting effects, maybe a, a toe reveal or reception desk. That's just self-illumination. You're not gonna spend time you know, building a little bitty tiny light family. If you have to do um, uh, an LED strip, again, it can be done with self-illumination. So you'll find your furniture, you'll find your directional signage. It's, you can do self-illumination with not only solid materials, but also with images. So that's how we're doing computer screens. Um, restaurants, cafes, sometimes you have to have illuminated menu boards, even things like uh, exit signs, just illuminated, just illuminated geometry. There's no light in any of those objects. The second thing you want to think about is materials. And it depends on how you apply the parameter of materials, but you're limited in some ways, depending on how you start. So this wood floor is a procedural wood floor. We go to the family in Revit. I'm going to select the floor go to edit type and go into the type properties. At the moment, this is 
Well, Revit has a lot of procedural materials. They're very easy starting points for rendering. The, the challenge is they don't have a lot of control. So first of all, I think lighting is really important to a project because it gives you that ambient quality that, it, that creates an appropriate impression. But if the light isn't bouncing off materials in a way that looks natural, not just realistic, but natural, and it, it doesn't distract, um, unless light is bouncing off things in the right way, it's, just, it's very, very distracting. So what we're seeing here is the light is bouncing off this floor, which is actually a, a sample from a, it's, it's a manufacturer sample. I've tweaked it a little bit, but the way that the light is bouncing, it gives the impression that this floor is made of plastic. So I would recommend that you not use these procedural materials. So in this case, it's a procedural wood material because you have limited control over how that material behaves. So for example, with the finish, you only have a range of four and you'll never use these upper and lower ranges because they're just too severe and then you're kind of stuck in the middle. So what if you want to put a value of 50% finish? You can't even get to that value here. Um, and then the other option is this bump uh, control or like a relief pattern. Um, you can only raise the value in whole numbers from, from zero to 10 or zero to negative 10. And so again, that's gonna make big changes and it's just not enough control. If you use a generic asset, you get all of the control over that material. So here's what it looks like as a generic asset and here's what it looks like as a procedural wood material. But you don't want to delete the material and then recreate it as a generic material because anything that's been assigned to that material will lose the assignment. What you wanna do is go to this little option that says replace this asset and click on it and you're gonna be taken to the asset browser and you can go to the appearance library, select default and double click generic. That will convert a procedural material into a generic asset and you can go the other way as well. But now you've got all the control you want over that material and by not deleting the material name, you haven't reset all of those assignments throughout the project. So I'm just gonna select this wood floor asset and go right back out to Revit. And what we'll see is that the wood floor is not reflecting light in a very, very unnatural way now. Um, we can actually get down in here and we can see a bit more grain. We can see a bit more subtlety of that material. And it's not like with a mirror like a natural looking finish. So that's the first thing with materials. It's, it's really how the light is reflecting off of them and is the material behaving properly. Um, the next thing has to do with texture. So we're kind of Textures are materials, but if you'll think about, you know, this floor is a texture, but you can also think about a texture in terms of an image or a printed image. And I'm just gonna go over here uh, to this painting, or it could be a TV screen. Textures have changed in that you can apply them, you can give them self-illumination, and in 3.0, you can actually animate them as well. So this is an animated, this is just an MP4 file that's been associated to the texture of the back glass inside of this video cabinet. So you can add a lot of natural realism now. So let's go through the process of, of setting up a texture so that it's properly oriented, uh, giving it self-illumination, and then ultimately we want to give it um, uh, an animation. We want to animate the texture. So I'm just going to go back to Revit, zoom into this object, spin it around, and double click to open it up. Here's the family in realistic mode. The material has been applied using the paint tool. I'm gonna to go back to the modify tab and just take the material assignment away, kind of start from scratch. So you can use the paint tool to apply a material. That's just applying the image directly. You can also use a paint tool to apply a parameter that refers to a material. And that's the option we wanna use. And the reason for that is when you get the component in the project, if you've mapped the material assignment to a parameter, you simply have to select the component to find out its properties and its parameters. You can change an image. If you just apply the material or the image directly, um, it's, it's gonna be really, really hard to find that image later on. The other thing we wanna do is when we apply the image, we don't, I don't use the decal tool. Decals are host dependent. I just use the paint tool and there's some uninteresting technical reasons for that. But essentially, it's just predictable because it's not uh, it's not a hosted element. So I've already set up a material parameter here that refers to this appropriate image. And here's the difference that you're going to see when you apply, when you start to use a paint tool. 
Here's the image itself. Here's the parameter that refers to this image. We're going to select this option that says parameter, click on the face of the geometry, and Revit's just going to apply that image to one face. It's not applying it to all six sides of this, of this shape. And then we're going to open up the material editor. And let's just find that image. And it's not that one. I thought it was canvas, but maybe it's it's here we go, screen image, which refers to that. So once you've got the material assigned, you're going to have to open up that material and change some properties right away. And the first one is probably unlocking the aspect ratio option and just giving it a real world size. So this image is four foot 11 by three foot three. And then we're going to have to set the origin. And what most people will do is use a position tool to set the origin in a, in a well, use it all the time maybe in the project environment. The thing is with the position tool is it's a one-off. And just because you set it correctly here, when you load this into the project, it's gonna be different. And if you have a new instance, it's gonna be different. So don't use the position tool. Notice that I've given uh, this here, I've given this value of uh, presently it's at zero, zero. In, in uh, what you can basically do in the family editor is create a model pattern that is the same size as the image. We do this in the project environment all the time. And then just like in the project environment, use that model pattern to set the origin. And you can do it visually. You can use the align tool. It's, it's very, very obvious when you move that model pattern. And we do that with things like little ceiling grids, floor patterns, um, masonry coursing. You know, you move the pattern to align it for documentation purposes. That moves the underlying image. So here we've got a model pattern, just a simple cross hatch that's four foot 11 by three foot three. We go to a hidden line view and you have to do this in the family editor. Tab, select, you can press and drag. Okay, and that will move the underlying image and it locks it without even saying that you wanna lock it. This is a, kind of a, this is a universal setting. So I'm just gonna go to the front elevation and use the align tool to align each of these edges which is gonna fix it here. We're gonna put this back in the project and it's gonna update the project, which means that it's gonna update inside of Enscape, right? And again, the nice thing about saving these images as, uh, or assigning the image as a parametric material assignment is that you can fix it uh, quickly after the fact. So when you wanna swap out that image with, you know, if you wanna swap this image out with something else, it's not a matter of going to Revit and trying to guess what that image is. When you select a component, it's actually going to take you to the parameter. Okay, so we're going from uh, textures to assigning the orientation of a texture, and now we're going to assign a, an animated texture. When you assign an animated texture, first of all, you don't need to take away the regular material assignment. So here the material has been assigned once as an image and once with self-illumination. That's why we're getting, uh, that's why we're seeing the image glow in a low light condition. It's because we've assigned self-illumination to it. If you want to assign an animated texture, and there's a multitude of, of uh, movie formats, MOV, MP4, uh, just a, a whole bunch, Windows, Windows formats as well as Mac, you have to go through the identity value. So here we are on the identity tag, and there's a very particular format that the path to the video has to contain. So you have, this is a, this is mentioning that you've got a video, it's gonna be a certain path, an absolute path, and then an X direction, Y direction, which is the uh, real world size of the video, and then does it have any rotation value? If you don't follow that format, it's not gonna work. It's not even gonna tell you anything. It's just never gonna show up. So I usually keep this formatted bit of script inside a notepad file on my desktop. And then if I need it, I can quickly copy it and paste it. I've already got the formatted uh, version of what it would want here in the comments field, and I'm just going to control C to copy it. You want this assignment to go in the description path. So just control C to paste, select apply, and you still got the uh, still image there if you need to see that. But now there's an animated texture. You won't see anything different in Revit, but when you go back to Enscape, it's already self-illuminated, so it's taken on the property values of the image, the still image, which has self-illumination applied, and it's applied here as well. And, um, and then that's just going to work. So you can do lots of fun things with this. I've seen very practical things like crosswalk signs, um, 
the material on a uh, on a uh, like a traffic control sign going from yellow to red to green and then cycling through um, but crosswalks and I've also seen things like just TV screens sports screens uh, in in uh, cafes in uh, sports clubs and then I just was playing around and got this component out of the SketchUp warehouse and and uh, converted it into an Enscape asset and then added swapped out the image in the back for the screen with an animated texture. So that's textures, uh, texture assignment orientation and animated textures. The last thing I wanna show you is the ability to associate an Enscape asset uh, with a component family. And the reason you wanna do this, you don't, want to, you don't want to place Enscape assets directly in your project is because, um, well, some of them are okay, but they don't look good and they don't know how to behave. So I'm gonna open up the Enscape asset um, the asset browser. The Enscape assets for consistency and some other important reasons have all been modeled as planting category. So if you place a piece of furniture in your project, it's not going to ever schedule as a piece of furniture. It's going to schedule under planting. Um, and then you can spend a lot of time trying to go into each category and change it, but then it's going to change the next time you update Enscape. It's just not worth it. There's just really a better way. So if you're going to place an asset directly in the project, you're sort of clicking and you sort of orient it. We'll just spin this around and place it. And in Enscape, it looks great, but that's not the challenge. The challenge is in Revit, it looks terrible. Um, they are very heavy. Um, they're going to make your files heavy. They're visually, everything is shown all the time, even for these little proxies. And um, they're just it's it's not going to be good for your project. I've seen where if you take all of the Enscape assets and put them in an empty Revit project, your file will balloon to over a gigabyte. Now the Revit components know how to behave. I've just got a Revit task chair here, uh, but the downside, well, it knows how to behave in terms of level of detail, orientation, category for scheduling. The challenge is that in Enscape, they just they don't create enough emotional weight. They don't carry enough emotional weight. So I'm going to go back to Revit and look at the instance parameters um, or look at the type parameters of this chair. In a moment, what we're going to have are some additional parameters that Enscape is going to create and assign to this particular family down to the type. So one Revit family with multiple types can host the asset information of multiple Enscape assets. And you can do this with everything and it keeps your projects nice and light. So like this video game in the back, this little video game cabinet is just one particular video game cabinet, but we can have multiple types. It's very lightweight geometrically. It knows how to schedule, it knows how to tag, it knows how to dimension. But we can see the Enscape asset in Enscape. And the way to do this is go back to your uh, Enscape tab in Revit, go to the asset library, and there's a little option for every family as well as every custom family that you create to associate the Enscape asset with the Revit family. So we're just gonna go back to furniture and throttle it down to office furniture. And you wanna go to this little, down here in the lower right, these little three ellipses. You get this option to link a Revit family to an asset. Click that option and it's gonna open up a little family browser. I'm just gonna to start to type in the word task for this task chair. If there was more than one type, it would list all of the types and then select okay. And then that's it. What it's gonna do is create the parameters in that Revit family so that instead of seeing the Revit family in, inside of Enscape, you're now going to see the Enscape asset. So if we go back to Enscape, it's here. It knows how to show up here. It knows how to schedule over here. And if you select this and let's create another instance, we'll place one over here. It's gonna show up here. This will keep your Revit projects very light. will help them schedule properly. Um, it won't weigh them down with, uh, you know, like spider web covered components. And uh, you can actually go another step further. You can nest Enscape assets in some cases inside of Revit families. So if you have a table and you always want the same set of entourage to show up on that table, or maybe you have some options, you can control it. Um, you can control it with parameters, but you can even have, uh, you know, a bookshelf that's already pre-populated with books and things. So this is the kind of stuff that's changed. It's updated in Enscape 3. Um, do you guys have any questions now? We'll open it up again. Yeah, I got a question from Christopher. Um, 
So he had an issue. I don't know. Can you look at the chat? He had an issue with rendering a video. Yeah. Oh, I want to open it up. Okay. Rendering a video oh. and you would think I could find the chat window, but maybe it's not. No. There. So yeah. it's rendering a video um, would assign a total amount of two minutes and certain points of interest and the flight path. Yeah. But he kept adjusting it and the two points and the overall time was 10 minutes. It took forever to adjust each camera point to a specific second. Is there a better way to set up a render path and a time? There is so much a better way. And I can show you quickly. Everybody else might not be interested, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Do it. Um, let me uh, minimize the size of that window. And we're going to open up the animation tool. I believe it's the K key, unless they've changed it. Well, I'm just going to do it here. It's now the V key. OK. So we're going to set up a path here. The K key starts the path. It's showing up down here. I'm going to move forward to here, press the K key again. Then I'm going to move over and press the K key again. And then we can see that Enscape has given us a total duration of six seconds. And we don't even, obviously, it looks like some of these uh, cameras are, we don't even know if they're evenly spaced apart. Let's say we want to do this in chunks of you know, five seconds to the first camera, five seconds to the second camera, five, you know, and so on. So you click on this first instance, you can't override the timestamp. It's not possible. Second instance, timestamp. And we can say this one is five seconds. Always make sure to update, otherwise it doesn't do anything. And then we'll go to the third camera. And, oh, third camera can't have a timestamp. That's annoying, okay? So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go up here and select this option that says save path to file. And I'm just going to throw it on the desktop. Enscape video path. And then I'm going to open up the video path with an XML editor. You can just use Notepad. Let's see, open with Notepad. And look what we have, timestamps. And why there's five nines of accuracy uh, or four nines of accuracy. See, we have a timestamp here, position, 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 and it says five seconds. So what you can do is actually get to the timestamp, even in situations where you can't get to it, like with this third timestamp. I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to go right after here where it says order two, and I'm going to highlight that and paste it. And I'm going to say that this timestamp is at 16 seconds. And this timestamp is at eight seconds, and then save it and go back to Enscape. And I've noticed this happens. I've got to go back to Revit first and then back to, oh no, it does this sometimes in Zoom. Let me go back here. There's one, and there's the other. All right, we go from here and go load path from file. There's our animation path open. And now we have an animation path that <laughs> actually shows a total duration here, but this last camera now has a timestamp option. So we can go here to here to here. And I would always advocate uh, using the XML files a way to get it all of the times. Um, as a matter of fact, it's the only way I know how to hack a starting point for an animation where you want the camera to rest. So let's say you're at the beginning point here and you don't want the camera moving around um, you want the camera to stay play stay 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 in place for like five seconds and then start moving well you could put a camera on top of the camera go to the very end put a camera on top of the camera and then open up the xml file that you've saved and then give it five seconds from camera one to camera two which is just going to sit there for five seconds and not move and then when you get to the end it's going to get to the next to the last camera and then be told just sit still for five seconds. So it does that transition. It's also a really great way, uh, editing the XML file is a great way to do a jump cut. So instead of creating five different video sequences all around the building and having to manually render each sequence, just do one long path. And then when you open the XML file, give it like one one hundredth of a second to travel from the last camera to the next camera in the sequence. And it'll just render the whole sequence as one long sequence, but it's not rendering a bunch of frames between things you don't care about. It's called a jump cut.
The only right. way I know I know how to do it is with that uh, is with the XML file. Christopher said thanks. It was very helpful. Sure. I have a question from Nico that wants to know if there's any tips in hand. Oh wait, sorry, there was one before him from uh, Simon. If you make a mistake mapping the Enscape asset to a Revit family, is there a way to unmap those? Yeah, just delete it. Take it out. Doesn't know what it is. Just delete the family. Well, uh, no, just uh, you could change the value. Like you could change the oh, okay. number to something else. Um, but if you just make a mistake and don't like it, you can actually open up the family and just delete those parameters and reload it in the project that doesn't know what to do. To like go. even if, okay. if even if you go into this and say, oh, the type value for this. If you said, I don't want to render this for just a moment. I don't want to see it. Then if you give this a number, it's not going to have any matches, and then it's not going to know what to render inside of Enscape. Okay. And then, are there any tips on handling metal surfaces, controlling reflections for round surfaces, et cetera? Don't use metal. The <laughs> procedural metal looks terrible and it looks sparkly all the time. It's one of those, it's another procedural material. It looks terrible. If you just change it to a generic asset and give it a little bit of, just make it a light gray, give it a little bit of reflectivity, you won't get those distracting artifacts. They're terrible and they're worse in VR because you can't stop moving and Enscape, when it does that fuzzy thing, it's always rendering those artifacts until the cameras, until it's able to settle down. So like in Revit, the default material assigned to stain, to steel, like structural steel, is stainless steel as a color. It looks stupid, you know, having your building show up like a, like it's been dipped in chrome and polished. Yeah. yeah. So just, okay. just don't use any, don't use any of those procedure materials. You can make something that looks way better just starting with a generic asset. All right, that is it on the questions, All right. the chats. Very good, thank you, Laura. Yeah. I will um, conclude now. I hope you guys have a great day. And Laura, once this is done processing, I'll send you a link to download. Thank you, and um, people are yeah. saying thank you on the chat. chat. So have a great very day informative, today. well done. Glad thank you, it. Phil. Bye. Bye.